I'm John Diamond. I'm the president and CEO of the University of Maine Alumni Association, and I'm certainly glad you're able to join us today for what's going to be a very exciting program. Our topic is the 2019 Mount Everest e expedition led by UMaine Professor Paul Majewski. Uh, Dr. Majewski is going to share the story of the expedition and its scientific and research value, and he'll also explain how this work uh, international work that he and others are doing fits with UMaine's teaching, research, and public service mis mission, and as well as how well it fits with the university's international reputation for climate studies. Uh, there'll be opportunities for you to pose questions to Dr. Majewski, so let me just explain how you can do that. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little cartoon speaking bubble. Uh, that's the chat button. So if you want to submit a question at any point, just click on that bubble, type in your question and hit enter or return on your keyboard. And we'll get to as many questions as we can during the 90 minutes that we have scheduled for this presentation and Q&A. Um, and just so you know, we're recording this session and it will be available online through the uh, Alumni Association's website. And we'll share that information with you uh, after the fact, so uh, you know where to go. Um, let's get started. To provide a little context, let me share some background about Dr. Majewski. It, it's very impressive. Uh, Dr. Majewski is the Director and Professor of, Chi of Climate Change Institute, of the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine, and he's also a distinguished professor in the schools of Earth and Climate Sciences, School of Marine Sciences, School of Policy and International Affairs, and the Maine Business School, and then also the University of Maine Law School. So he is very involved, not just with the university itself in its academic and research areas, but also throughout the system with his involvement in the Maine Law School. He is an internationally acclaimed glaciologist, climate scientist, and polar explorer. Uh, he's led more than 60 expeditions to some of the remotest reaches of the planet. And that includes many field seasons traveling across Antarctica, covering more than 25,000 kilometers, more than 100 first ascents of mountains in our Antarctica, traverses over Greenland and many field seasons at high altitudes throughout the Himalayans, Tibetan Plateau, and the Andes. Paul has more than 450 scientific publications and two popular books. One is The Ice Chronicles, and the other is Journey into Climate. His contributions to science include discovery of human impacts on the chemistry of the atmosphere, modern Antarctic and Himalayan ice loss, abrupt, cli abrupt climate change and the impact of climate change on past civilizations, and the impacts of modern abrupt climate change. Paul has received numerous national and international honors, such as the first ever internationally awarded Medal for Excellence in Antarctic Research, offered from a field of 45 countries and all disciplines, and the Explorers Club Lowell Thomas Medal. He is the first person to develop and lead highly prominent climate change research programs at the three poles, the Greenland Ice Sheet Project 2, which involved 25 U.S. institutions, the International Trans-Antarctic Scientific Expedition, which involved 21 countries, and the one we're going to hear about today, the National Geographic and Rolex Perpetual Planet Extreme Mount Everest Expedition. He's also led high-profile public outreach efforts with organizations such as the American Museum of Natural History, and the Boston Museum of Science. Uh, Dr. Majewski has also appeared hundreds of times in national news media, such as the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the PBS series Nova, National Public Radio, the BBC, 60 Minutes on CBS, and most recently, the Emmy Award-winning Showtime series Years of Living Dangerously. So as you can see, you mean is very fortunate to have uh, a world-renowned researcher of Dr. Majewski's caliber. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Majewski. Thank you, John, uh, for the introduction. And I'm, I'm very honored to be at the University of Maine. It's a wonderful place to be surrounded by 
fantastic faculty and staff and, and amazing undergraduate and graduate students. Let me put my screen on here and let's hope that this goes as smoothly as we hope. But can everybody see that? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, good. Well, today uh, we're going to talk about pushing climate change to the roof of the world. Uh, this is all being done under the auspices of an organization and leadership of the National Geographic uh, Society and Rolex as part of a very large program that they have of which Mount Everest 2019, our expedition, uh, was the first and, and effectively the highest profile for the first year. Uh, Mount Everest is a very different place uh, from where most of us live right now. Today, the temperature is about seven degrees Fahrenheit on the top of Mount Everest, uh, which of course is expected. It's so high, it's a little bit over 29,000 feet. Uh, but what's even more remarkable is that the oxygen content compared to sea level is about 35%. And the winds, of course, can be extremely, extremely strong, uh, on occasion blowing people off the mountain. But before I, I delve into Mount Everest and our expedition, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the Climate Change Institute, uh, in particular because uh, Mount Everest, uh, the Mount Everest project uh, is a very important part of many of the things that we've done. We have a 50 year legacy of exploration and discovery. Uh, we are one of the oldest multidisciplinary climate research units in the world. Uh, and like, as do many different climate research units, we look at the present, trying to understand what's going on today, but we also go back in the past to look for analogs of warmer and colder uh, climates than today, stormier, uh, how fast does the climate operate? And we do all of this so that we can understand and do a better job of predicting the future, which requires monitoring the development of climate models and the incorporation of past climate and other uh, and other, uh, whoops, sorry, okay. So in order to look at past, present, and future climate, we develop new technologies, we've developed software that's publicly available. In one case, we get two to 3,000 hits on our climate reanalyzer software a day. And we've developed new approaches uh, to the way we can make predictions. Uh, to do our research, uh, we have to write a lot of grants uh, in very competitive situations. We're funded by many different organizations. We have a faculty of about, uh, well, of close to 60 people and support close to 60 graduate students in the process. Our work takes us all around the world. Uh, as a consequence, we've made some important contributions to climate science, trying to understand what actually makes the climate change under natural conditions, how humans have impacted it, uh, how fast can large ice sheets decay and increase sea level, how do ecosystems change as a consequence of climate change, how in fact have human civilizations disappeared as a consequence of climate change, and how has the chemistry of the atmosphere changed over time, in particular as a consequence of human activity, and then we also discovered what's called abrupt climate change, the fact that the climate system can switch very rapidly in less than a couple of years to a very different state. It actually just happened between 2007 and 2012 with the warming of the Arctic. Uh, we're obviously uh, a state institution and we take a many of the things that we learn and bring them back home to Maine. But at the same time, we also do an awful lot of work in Maine. We've developed uh, reports to uh, begin to understand uh, and predict how Maine's climate will change in the future. Uh, we're heavily involved in public health issues, uh, in particular, the migration of uh, vector-borne diseases and, li and Lyme tick. Uh, we provide information and software for the public to understand how fast uh, climate is changing in Maine and other parts of the world. And we take multidisciplinary approaches to all of these things. Plus we introduce graduate students and undergraduates uh, to a wide range of the things that we consider to be climate. Uh, our view of climate is not just physical climate, temperature, precipitation, it's also chemical climate, biological climate, and the social implications. 
The Institute also addresses the four major impacts of climate change, health and resource depletion, how it affects the economy, uh, how it changes the frequency and strength of catastrophes, and the geopolitical implications of climate change. For example, the recent opening up of the, uh, the Arctic Ocean. So we're heavily involved in all of these things. In the process, we work all over the world, as you can see from the red dots on the map, and we are extremely proud of the fact that we have included hundreds of graduate students uh, in our research programs, both in Maine and all around the world. We introduce them to on-site actual observations. We, they help in writing proposals. Their uh, masters and PhDs are dedicated uh, to the scientific uh, findings, so they're published in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, and many of our students have spent several months in the field in remote areas learning how to live there, also understanding the area and continuing. So if you put all of these things together, perhaps T.S. Eliot explains best what our institute does. Uh, and I'll just quote him quickly. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So our goal is to contribute to Maine by working in Maine and to contribute to Maine's future uh, by working in other parts of the world and bringing that information home so that it can benefit Maine and the rest of the world. I started working in the Himalayas in 1980. Uh, we actually recovered the very first ice cores ever recovered in the Himalayas at about 20,000 feet. Uh, and just to give you an idea of how hard it is to work in the Himalayas, it took us six weeks uh, from the time we left home to the time that we got to 20,000 feet. We went over what you can see on this slide, three 500 meter high, 1500 feet, uh, foot high ice falls. And I'll talk about ice falls a bit more when we focus more on Everest. Uh, and that was the beginning for me and the beginning in many ways for climate research. Uh, not necessarily that I did uh, a very significant part of it, but for climate research in the Himalayas. Now we understand much more about the Himalayas, uh, as you'll find out. And in fact, why it's so important to the rest of the world. Uh, I was also the leader of a joint Chinese uh, humane ex series of expeditions, which we conducted in the late 90s, uh, where we lived uh, for several weeks, close to 7,000 meters, recovering an ice, uh, ice core from the north side of Everest. And what you see in the foreground is the Rongbu Monastery. Uh, it's the, uh, the last bit of civilization before you make your way up Mount Everest from the north side. Now let's focus on the uh, the 2019 Everest expedition. Uh, and Everest is a uh, obviously an iconic place. Uh, everybody knows that Mount Everest is the highest place on earth. It's such an important place that it actually has three different names. Uh, in Tibetan and Chinese, it's called Chomolongma, uh, which basically means goddess. In, uh, in Nepal, it's called Sagamatha, which means the head of the sky. Uh, and most of us in the West call it Mount Everest. But it's important to remember uh, that it has tremendous amount of local uh, importance, cultural importance, and is iconic. There are two basic approaches to Mount Everest. Uh, one was the one I mentioned in the last slide, uh, coming along the Rongbu Glacier from Tibet on the northern side. The other one is the approach to uh, the red circled area, which is Mount Everest, coming from the south side and Nepal up the Khumbu uh, Glacier Valley and eventually onto the Khumbu Glacier. The Himalayas are one of Earth's very important water towers. It's a water tower because it collects water uh, and stores it in glaciers, of which in the Himalayas there are about 70,000 glaciers. As you can get some idea of uh, from this picture, obviously uh, taken from above uh, Earth's atmosphere. In the process, the Himalayan water tower provides about 20% of the water needed for Earth's, uh, for, I should say, uh, provides water to 20% of, uh, of Earth's population. Quite dramatic. And we'll learn a little bit more today about how that might change in the future and the implications that it might have. The glaciers all over the, mount, all over the world that exist in mountain regions are melting. 
Uh, and if you look at this satellite image, it's taken from the Himalayas, over the Himalayas. Uh, the red circle uh, represents the, the forward snout edge of a glacier. And these, these edges are retreating, and they're retreating fast. And if you look carefully, uh, the difference between the, uh, the bluish and the brown looks like a little ridge, and that's actually a former position of this particular glacier. Uh, if we work our way up the glacier, we see this very large blue area as we ascend in elevation. Uh, and that large blue area is blue because the snow's gone and because this portion of the glacier is melting. And as you can see from all of the blue areas on this uh, satellite image, uh, many of the glaciers uh, in, well, all of the glaciers in the Himalayas obviously have regions in which they melt, but as it turns out, these melt regions are getting larger and larger. And the collection basins, the whiter areas above them, where the snow falls, are getting smaller and smaller. The net result is that the volume of the glaciers is decreasing. As these glaciers melt, uh, melt water comes out, making large lakes, the, the third uh, red uh, ellipse in this particular case. These large lakes are, uh, can, can be quite dangerous. In some cases, they're held along the edge of the glacier. And eventually, as that glacier melts, or as that, the meltwater effectively burns its way through the edge of the glacier, we, get, we can have massive uh, floods. And some of these floods have actually wiped out populations in entire valleys. Uh, leading to the loss of, of many, many lives. At, and in the process of all of this melting, all of the slopes around these glaciers, all of the entire region becomes much more saturated and slope stability becomes a harder and harder problem. Remember that the Himalayas provide the, the greatest relief that we have on the planet. So they are extremely, extremely uh, susceptible to slope failure. And then, of course, we get to the highest reaches of the Himalayas, outlined very, uh, <clears throat> in a very sketchy way uh, with this big red ellipse. We don't know a lot about these high areas. We've worked in them, many of us, for a long time, uh, but they cover very, very large areas uh, and very little on-site scientific observation is being made. Mount Everest has been impacted, and the Khumbu Valley and the Himalayas, not only by climate change, but also by a dramatic increase in tourism and a dramatic increase in the population in this area. Uh, in the 1995 image on the top, which is when we first started working in the Himalayas, you see this small hut. It was the only uh, building in this entire area. And if you look uh, down to the bottom, you'll see a green roof. That's the old hut now surrounded by a series of hotels uh, and restaurants. Now, they're not exactly the same sort of thing we think about as uh, hotels and restaurants at home, <clears throat> but they're extremely charming, uh, and you can see how much areas have changed. So why did, uh, why did uh, National Geographic and Rolex pick Mount Everest? Yeah. Number one, it's iconic. Uh, number two, it's an unprecedented opportunity for science. Uh, with National Geographic and Rolex, we were able to mount a multi-interdisciplinary expedition that actually could stay in this area for a relatively long period of time, several weeks. And in addition, the work that we were able to conduct uh, is the beginning of starting to fill a large void and that void is an understanding of what happens above 5,000 meters, roughly 16,000 feet <clears throat> in, <clears throat> throughout the world. And it's also an opportunity to still stand on the earth and touch the jet stream. And as you'll find out, the jet stream is very important, not only to what happens in the Mount Everest area, but as we probably all realize, the shape of the jet stream is a great determinant in what happens uh, throughout North America, the Northern Hemisphere, and Maine. Uh, uh, it determines what uh, the, how stable our weather will be, whether it'll be, uh, we'll get warm air penetrating farther north, cold air penetrating farther south, uh, and we know that there's been a great deal of change. We started our expedition April 1st, 
Uh, in Kathmandu at 1,400 meters, 4,600 feet, this is a, just an absolutely beautiful city. The reddish is, in fact, what you do see. This comes from a, uh, an image off a postcard that's uh, sold in Kathmandu. I, I liked it particularly for the, for the reddishness. And you can see that there's still a tremendous amount of local culture uh, as evidenced by the, uh, this, uh, the buildings, the, uh, the monasteries in this area. It's a rapidly a uh, building city uh, with many, several million inhabitants. Uh, they suffered a terrible earthquake a few years ago, and they, but they are rebuilding. We left Kathmandu <clears throat> typically to get to Everest. You either get in a fixed wing aircraft uh, or in a helicopter. <clears throat> when we had our expedition uh, last, uh, last year, the fixed wing aircraft couldn't land. Uh, at the elevation that I'll show you in a second, uh, because the, uh, the airport really was no longer able to handle all the fixed wing aircraft. Uh, so we took a helicopter, which took for many helicopter trips to get the 35 scientists and all the equipment needed up to base camp. And uh, once you start walking, and I'll show you uh, where we started walking from, uh, once we start walking, it takes about if you want to acclimatize correctly, it's anywhere between about five and 10 days of gradually walking uphill. Uh, the person in the lead here is Heather Clifford, uh, a master's student from our institute who was involved in the project and who is still with us now as a PhD student. Uh, within about three days of hiking, you get to Namche Bazaar, uh, another place that has changed dramatically even since the middle 1990s. It's a, a, a remarkable uh, town that is all built from local stone with some amount of lumber that comes in. Uh, it is the home of many of the Sherpas, the high altitude uh, people who help us and carry all of the loads in, in the Everest. Elevation, a little bit over 11,000 feet. So it's now taken two to three days to get to about 11 and a half thousand feet uh, from Kathmandu. As you climb higher and higher uh, towards Mount Everest, uh, we go past many stupas. Uh, these are obviously Hindu uh, areas of worship. And classically, you walk to the left around these uh, as the local people do. Uh, and you can see a series of stone slates off on the right-hand side be behind the boy that's playing. And these have prayers written on them for people going higher, for people who, who are hoping that their uh, things will happen in a more positive direction for them. Uh, and then you climb higher and higher. A particular person is a, is a local Sherpa from the area who worked with us and he helped run the logistics at, at our base camp. He'd been up Everest several times in the past. As one continues to climb higher, uh, you get into a region with these monuments, and this is uh, an area that is, uh, each of these monuments is dedicated uh, to uh, various people who have succumbed uh, to Mount Everest. Uh, many of them are famous climbers. Uh, one of them is a very famous Sherpa who did more than 20 ascents of Mount Everest, was the first person ever uh, to uh, actually set up a tent on the top of Mount Everest and spend the night not using oxygen. Keep in mind that 99% of the people who ascend Mount Everest are using oxygen by the time they get up to the upper elevations. This was a, a Sherpa, a very famous Sherpa who did not. And then eventually you get up to close to 5,000 meters to a town called Lubuche, uh, 16,000 feet. Another town that has emerged as a consequence of tourism uh, in the area. Uh, and a very interesting place. Unfortunately, this was a place where uh, several of us uh, contracted uh, a virus and uh, some of us ended up having to go down for a little while and then walk back up again. Uh, the, the quarters are very close in this area when you stay in the, in the shelters, so it's very easy um, to get sick. And getting sick at high elevation is non-trivial, uh, but most of us made it right back up again uh, in order to get up to base camp, we use not only helicopters to transport equipment, but uh, we also uh, use yaks. And these yaks are well suited to high elevation. Interestingly enough, 
Uh, the acts are having to graze higher and higher as a consequence of greenhouse gas warming because it's too warm for them at the lower uh, elevations. Uh, and obviously it's much cheaper to use uh, yaks than helicopters. Uh, and, and it's a wonderful experience working with these animals and the porters and uh, the various uh, guides who come with them. And then as you begin to get higher and higher, you see this rubbly area uh, and in the center, you see a, a jagged looking glacier. This is the Kumbu Glacier and surrounding it are all of the, obviously the, the peaks above 8,000 meters that include Everest and other regions. Notice some of the amazing photography. Uh, most of it's done by National Geographic uh, photographers and contractors. This particular one is done by uh, Mario Potorsky my PhD student who was on the summit team. <clears throat> and he is, in fact, uh, you'll see many of his uh, photographs. He's an award-winning photographer and in, in addition to being a, uh, an amazing scientist. And then eventually you get to, uh, to base camp, close to 18,000 feet. It's typically populated by, believe it or not, about 1,000 people uh, during the climbing season, which tends to be middle April to the end of May. Uh, and it's a busy area. Uh, there are all sorts of expeditions that are, have now made their way up here. All of these tents disappear completely during the non-climbing season. Uh, and nowadays, all of the waste that is produced by the thousand people who, who uh, are here training to go up to the summit of Everest or providing support, all of that waste is now removed. Are the slides still appearing correctly? Good, good. Uh, during the climbing season and actually during the, uh, the tourist season, there are about 40,000 people uh, that visit base camp. So uh, Everest is a remarkable place. It's unbelievably high, obviously very treacherous, uh, but it's a region that's visited by a great number of tourists, unlike most of the, of the rest of the Himalayas. So, there are all of these strange uh, dichotomies about Mount Everest. Uh, if you fly in to uh, Everest Base Camp, this is what it looks like. Uh, to the left of the crevasses of the, of the Kumbu Glacier. Uh, and in the rubbly area, uh, you'll see yellow and orange tents, some of them very fancy, some of them much more primitive. Uh, and you can see it's in an area of very steep slopes, so had, there is avalanche potential. We were very fortunate. Uh, Conrad Anker, a very well-known climber in the area who was working with us uh, in the beginning of our project, uh, managed to uh, set out a site with, uh, 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 in coordination with the Sherpas who work here that was a, a really good safe site. A few years ago, there was an avalanche and unfortunately it, it took the lives of several people who were at this base camp. Uh, in the base camp, we each, it's very fancy, we each had our own tent, which is not common for the way we usually work. Uh, these are North Face V25 tents. They're really fantastic in all sorts of conditions. Uh, all of the tents and eating areas are set up on this rubbly, very, very bumpy terrain. So just walking around base camp uh, is a bit of an exercise by itself and good training. Uh, we had a large tent where we ate our meals. You can see the, the two women in the beginning. On the left is Heather Clifford, the, uh, the master's student. On the right is Laura Mattis, an undergraduate uh, who accompanied us. And then as you go back down through the rows, you see some of the, uh, some of the other scientists involved. <coughs> the uh, 2009 Everest expedition uh, was probably the most comprehensive scientific assessment of Mount Everest uh, uh, thus far uh, attained. And uh, it was made up of several disciplines, meteorology, uh, atmospheric and hydrosphere comp uh, composition, glacial geology, biology, uh, mapping. Uh, and in some of these cases, we actually achieved world records uh, based on the things that we uh, were able to find. But the most important thing was that this was a multidisciplinary expedition and all of the disciplines worked together in an interdisciplinary way uh, to eventually, because we're still writing papers, uh, to eventually uh, provide, we hope, some important uh, contributions uh, to the understanding of how things are changing in this region, mountain regions in, 
in, in general and how this all fits into the world. So uh, there are six scientists from the University of Maine who were involved in this project. Uh, and uh, three of them were involved in the geology team, which was uh, co-led by Aaron Putnam, professor uh, at the University of Maine, plus two students, Peter Strand and Laura Mattis, uh, plus many other people, including um, many Nepalese uh, students from Tribhuvan University, our primary collaborator <coughs> in Nepal. <clears throat> the geology program spent its time collecting uh, lake cores uh, and rock samples. And you see here uh, an, ex uh, an example of the two University of Maine students collecting rock samples. Uh, by bringing these uh, rocks back home <clears throat> and uh, applying a variety of measurements, they can tell how recently these rocks uh, were exposed uh, to the atmosphere as opposed to covered by ice, which allows them to tell uh, the various marginal positions of older stages of the Kumbu Glacier. Um, oops, sorry about that. Uh, the lake sediment sampling uh, was uh, quite a challenge. Uh, they had, because we were there early in the season, several of the lakes were still frozen, uh, but eventually the lake coring team led primarily by uh, Montana State University, you see uh, Mary Hubbard in the, in the right over there, uh, along with uh, Freddie Wilkinson, National Geographic uh, writer, uh, used uh, two basically inflatable kayaks uh, tied together uh, and then sent a, a drilling system down uh, to recover a sediment core, uh, which is probably covers several thousand years worth of, of information. We also had a program dedicated to biology, extremophiles, which are organisms that live in extreme uh, conditions. Some work has certainly been done at high altitude before, but the our biologists were looking for signs of life in, in lakes, rocks, water, snow, ice, uh, in order to expand our understanding of where these organisms live and eventually to be able to find out how these organisms are changing their habitat, habitats as a consequence of climate change. Uh, the biology team came from the US and Nepal uh, and they did a variety of things. Uh, couple of world records, the highest centipede in the world, uh, the highest uh, caddis fly in the world, which is an organism that uh, is born in the water but ends up living on land. And they also uh, set up one of the highest so-called Gloria sites, Global Alpine Monitoring Networks, uh, basically to find out what, uh, they set up plots of, uh, uh, of study and then they try to count every single organism that lives in there. They also utilize, uh, eDNA, looking at environmental DNA, believe it or not, uh, that is shed from uh, not only uh, the excretion, but also the surface cells of organisms, fish, insects, mammals who happen to, to be drinking <clears throat> in order to get an environmental array of all of the organisms that are utilizing the lakes and, and rocks in the area. We had a very uh, elaborate uh, mapping program dedicated primarily to understanding how fast this glacier <coughs> is retreating and <coughs> excuse me to provide uh, information for about concerning slope stability, uh, the likelihood of, of, of damage due to flooding uh, and to do this, they took maps that currently exist, uh, one of which was done by uh, an old colleague of mine, Brad Washburn, former uh, director of the Boston Museum of Science, which he conducted in a very laborious way. Today, uh, of course, there are many more remote sensing techniques than uh, ever before. Uh, and one of the world records achieved by the mapping group, which was largely based by uh, National Geographic <coughs> researchers <coughs> plus contractors, it's the most detailed uh, LIDAR, which is a technique of bouncing light onto a uh, surface and, and seeing how long it takes to, to come back again. Photogra uh, photogrammetric imagery is the most detailed ever conducted for the Mount Everest region. So you can see the pink area. Also, there was LIDAR conducted from the uh, 
uh, from a helicopter, and it's the highest that a helicopter, to our knowledge, has ever gone uh, to conduct LIDAR measurements. 7,000 meters a helicopter is, is very high, fly, flying over this heavily crevassed area. <clears throat> from here, <clears throat> the program basically was focused on getting uh, the other teams uh, from the base camp area, uh, which I can put my pointer on, the base camp area is all of this area, up uh, uh, through the Kumbu Icefall and eventually uh, from the Kumbu Icefall uh, making their way up to uh, the summit or close to the summit of Everest. Uh, the Kumbu Icefall is the most treacherous part of the entire Everest summit. Uh, it's heavily crevassed. Uh, in order to get across this, bridges are set up by a Sherpa team that are called uh, the, the uh, mountain doctors. Uh, and they, uh, they reset the ropes and the, uh, the climbing ladders on a regular basis. Uh, there are typically several hundred people who make the attempt up Everest. I think the current uh, number who have successfully summited is, is several thousand. I've heard 5,000. I've also heard 8,000. Um, and as I mentioned before, when you get to the higher elevations, almost, almost all of these are utilizing oxygen, understandably. Uh, this gives you a, 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 an even more dramatic view of what the Kumbu Icefall looks like. On the right-hand side, uh, you can see somebody ascending a ladder with a headlamp. They have to start very early in the morning when it's still dark uh, in order to be able to have enough time uh, to safely get through the Kumbu Icefall. And you really want to stay out of this icefall as much as you can in the hottest part of the day because it begins to move around an awful lot. Uh, the, one of these blocks, if it falls over, is... Uh, Devastating. Sadly, uh, several Sherpas were killed a few years ago uh, by an avalanche and a movement of some of these blocks. But you can also see how packed people are getting through this area, and they're packed uh, because the actual climbing window uh, to get to the summit of Everest is typically only uh, a two, maybe one or two, three day windows. And in order to train for Everest, <clears throat> coming from <clears throat> From this side, it's essential to go up and down the Kumbu Icefall uh, two or three times in order to get to a high enough elevation to begin to acclimatize to get higher. This gives you an idea of what it's like to ascend uh, up the steep slopes of not just the Kumbu Icefall, but once you get above the Kumbu Icefall, uh, they're still not wearing oxygen at this elevation. Uh, you definitely don't want to fall here. You can see that people are wearing crampons, and if they do begin to fall, uh, they have an ascender which will clamp in and prevent them from falling too far. Once you get to the top of the Kumbu Icefall, you're at about 21,000 feet. Uh, things flatten off uh, relatively uh, for a little while, and of course the population dwindles uh, dramatically. Again, tents are set up. Loads are uh, set up by the Sherpas. Uh, loads are carried up to this elevation uh, along with all of the food. Then there's uh, the next stage is Camp 3, uh, 23,500 feet. You can see that the slope is steep. All of the tents, uh, again, the same tents that are used at base camp uh, are now being moved up to these elevations. Instead of one person uh, in a tent, uh, there are now at least two people in a tent, <clears throat> and everybody begins, they're now, by now they're on oxygen, they sleep with oxygen at a very low rate, and then as they start to exercise, they increase the flow rate. Uh, typically, one oxygen cylinder will last about four hours if you're exercising. So a lot of oxygen cylinders have to be uh, carried up. They weigh about four kilos. A typical uh, Sherpa carries mm, probably not much more than 10 or 12 kilos. So it's a tremendous amount of time going up and down for the, uh, for the Sherpas and for the climbers and the climber scientists uh, in our program. Uh, from uh, the, the last camp, so-called South Call Camp, uh, before the ascent to Everest is made, is at about 26,000 feet. You can see it's a, 
uh, it's an area that has now been deglaciated. Uh, if you look into the blue uh, region that the people are walking over, <clears throat> that's the base of what's called the South Call Glacier. Uh, and you can see that it's melting. You can see lines, uh, 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 stripes along it. Those are, those basically tell us uh, year by year, the dust layers that have come off the, the winds of the Tibetan Plateau and they allow us to count back year by year. It looks as if there aren't too many of them. There are actually hundreds of them. Uh, and we know that this ice is, uh, goes back in time several thousand years. The next program uh, that was conducted was a meteorology program. Uh, and uh, there are two things that they were trying to do. They wanted to install weather stations at very high elevations to make it safer for climbers uh, because little is known about the conditions at the top and also to find out how well the climate models were predicting what was happening up high. Uh, the meteorology team uh, came from Appalachian State <clears throat> in North Carolina, a colleague that we also work with in Peruvian Andes and Loughborough uh, University in the UK. <clears throat> you can see here four different automatic weather stations uh, that were put in. Uh, this one is at a relatively low elevation that was part of the program, gradually higher education, uh, elevation higher, and the one, the one that was put in on the south call was put in on rock, and you see it pictured in the lower left. This is not the highest one that was put in, and remember that uh, south call is at close to a little bit above 26,000 feet. <clears throat> the meteorology team uh, set two world records. Uh, one was the uh, automatic weather station at South Call at 79.45 meters, and then they made it up to 84.30 meters, which is 27,657 feet uh, with a weather station. And you see it pictured here on the left and the right. This is no trivial uh, feat. Uh, typically, you have at most about two hours in, uh, during the ascent to the summit of Mount Everest <clears throat> in which uh, you might safely be able to conduct some science. science. So they trained a long time uh, in order to be able to get this station up quickly, two uh, of our scientists uh, along with the Sherpa team helping them. You can see that they're covered. They're wearing down suits. They have oxygen masks. <clears throat> Their backpacks are basically uh, contain an oxygen cylinder, uh, a, a little bit of water, and that's about it. Once you get to these elevations, uh, you're almost, it's almost as if you're in a world by yourself. Uh, you are, uh, every single step that you make is the step that you think about. Uh, you begin to set your sights on something that's about 50 feet away. And that's about all you can think of at that time. How am I going to comfortably make the next 50 feet? Uh, and, but keep in mind, that this is, this is what, the, what the, the average climber going to the summit of Everest is thinking about. In the case of our scientific summit team, uh, they also had to think about all the equipment that they had, where were they put in this particular case, the automatic weather station? Uh, did they have all of the parts? and how would they get them all together? And when they eventually left that automatic weather station, would it still be working? And the answer is that most of it is still working. The uh, automatic weather station team <clears throat> was looking at a variety of climate or weather parameters, temperature, pressure, and wind speed. And they wanted to get the stations as high as they could to make conditions safer for climbers. Uh, and what you see here on the horizontal axis are uh, the number of days that the, these weather stations have been operating uh, while we were up there. Uh, and uh, then you see a, a bunch of uh, shaky lines. Uh, these are basically a, a lot of the data that's being collected. Uh, and the important thing is to look at the blue horizontal line. You want the best summit conditions are situations in which the temperature is warmer than about minus 27 degrees. Uh, when the pressure is as high as it can be, the pressure changes as a consequence of the air masses that come in. And remember that uh, as a consequence of uh, Everest summit elevation, 
the amount of oxygen on the summit is about 35 percent uh, or 33 percent of what one experiences at sea level. Base camp is about 50 percent. It's already challenging. If in fact a high pressure system comes through uh, and increases the pressure by just a little bit, that makes the conditions for climbing much better. If in fact the opposite happens, it's not good and it creates even more stress, less oxygen. And then the lower diagram, wind speed, you wanna climb uh, to the summit of Everest under conditions in which the wind speeds are significant, are, are as low as possible. So you need a combination of the right temperature, the right pressure, the right wind speed, and those windows are barely open for two or three days at a time, which is a bit of a rush uh, from the high camps. The other thing that the, uh, the meteorology team wanted to be able to demonstrate was uh, whether or not the climate models that have been the primary forecasting tool for climbers uh, are actually providing something that is close to reality. And the answer is, you can see the difference between the red, which is the forecast, and the black, which is the observation, they do pretty well. Uh, not perfectly, but they do extremely well. Uh, and this is very important, not only for the safety of climbers, but it's extremely important because we are assuming that all of the temperatures, pressures, wind speeds, et cetera, that go into the climate models for these upper elevations uh, are correct. Now we can actually say how close they are to being correct. Uh, the program is the glaciology program in which we uh, had three uh, uh, University of Maine scientists, myself, Heather Clifford, you saw the picture of, and Mario Potoski. Our goal was to sample uh, water, uh, ice, and snow in order to understand how uh, melting of these glaciers would, would or would not produce pollutants in the, in the water that many of the people live in this area, and also to collect ice cores that would allow us to understand how things had changed in the past. The, media, the automatic weather stations are phenomenal, but we wanted to also know uh, how, in fact, have the winds, uh, precipitation, temperature, uh, source of the winds, and pollutant transport to these high elevations changed over time. Uh, you see pictured here uh, in the right, uh, Heather, uh, <clears throat> using one of our ice coring drills to collect an ice core close to base camp. And you see in the upper left-hand side, one of our uh, the porters who work with us uh, collecting water samples to see what in fact the chemistry of the water is that's coming out of these glaciers. Uh, in the lower right, uh, you see a long list of measurements that are in the process of being done in our laboratories at the University of Maine. Uh, plus we've also enlisted uh, laboratories at Brown, Montana State, uh, and the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland uh, to do measurements that we don't do. We collected uh, water, snow, and ice from many different elevations. You can see what it's like to actually get up to uh, some of these higher sites to collect samples in this picture. Uh, and Mario Potoski uh, collected the highest ice core ever recovered in the world, 26,312 feet. Uh, right above that blue area that I mentioned earlier on South Cole. In the background, you see uh, Everest, the peak of Everest. Uh, and he was up there on his own, uh, well, on his own from the scientific team. The automatic weather station team was working uh, not too far away uh, with the help of all of the Sherpas surrounding him to collect these ice cores. To collect these ice cores, uh, it was necessary to uh, find a drill that was extremely lightweight. Uh, we got one off the shelf from Kovacs company that we've worked with before, but we had to make modifications to it to make it even lighter uh, for the actual drilling mechanism. We searched around, did a, uh, uh, some testing in, uh, on glaciers in Iceland three or four months before the expedition uh, in order to be able to, to assure that by the time we got up here, we would be able to collect in that short two hour window, which is about all you have for this kind of physical exertion, the highest ice core in the world. <clears throat> Here's a close up of Mario. 
with uh, the Sherpas helping him. You can see the drill on the right-hand side. So uh, what can we do with ice cores? If we look at the chemistry of ice cores, uh, we can see uh, that in fact, you can fingerprint uh, the direction an air mass came from. This is a, a NASA animation using actual satellite imagery that has been colorized. And just to mention briefly, the reddish uh, uh, feature that you see going from east to west is dust coming off the Tibetan Plateau and the Sahara. Note, note that it makes it all the way into the Amazon uh, and southeastern uh, US. And we can use that sort of chemistry from that dust, uh, chemistry from the ocean, chemistry from pollutant regions to track air masses. And Mount Everest and the Tibetan Plateau and the Himalayas are impacted by air masses that come in during the summer from the monsoon. Uh, the jet stream, the very same jet stream uh, that passes over Maine, uh, that carries from the west to the east, uh, not only moisture from the ocean, but pollutants from, in particular, Europe, and uh, also air masses that come off the Arctic. And these air masses are changing dramatically now. The Arctic is warming quickly. So all of a sudden, the air masses that come into the Everest region and the Himalayas are, being, are changing as a, co a consequence of Arctic warming, uh, which is not, not only changing the air that comes from the Arctic, but it's also shape changing the shape of the jet stream. And the other thing that we have learned uh, from our previous work on Mount Everest, which we will now be able to take to an even higher elevation, is the fact that there are pollutants coming from Asia, Europe, and even as far away as North America uh, that have increased dramatically uh, in the last few decades. Things like lead, cadmium, cesium, uh, copper, uh, and we can also tell whether or not legislation in the various countries feeding uh, these pollutants into the Mount Everest and the Himalayas are working. And the answer is yes. Uh, you can see drops in particular in the case of lead uh, uh, that are uh, related to legislation and the reduction of pollutant emissions. So these red dots that you see all over the map are the places around the globe uh, that we have collected ice cores in order to be able to document how the atmosphere has changed in terms of its movement, in terms of the amount of heat it, tra it transports, moisture uh, and pollutants. And the black uh, star obviously is Mount Everest. Our most recent uh, contribution to this overall understanding of how the global atmosphere uh, operates and how it's changed over time, uh, but also obviously the very highest. It is our chance to literally touch jet stream and collect samples in order to understand the history of the jet stream, combine this uh, with the automatic weather station data and with all of the information collected by the other disciplines of lower elevations. The goal of the expedition was to collect an ice core and, it, and put an automatic weather station right on the summit of Everest. We were not able to do it. We got within about 350 meters of the summit. And if you remember uh, the crowds that were going up the ice fall, <coughs> the, the cloud, excuse me, the crowds going up uh, from South Coal Camp, the highest camp, to the top of Everest where every bit as crowded. There were at least 200 people uh, ahead of uh, the summit team. Uh, and the summit team, of course, had a lot of science to do along the way. Uh, if you make a quick calculation, if each one of those 200 people spent one minute on the top of Everest, something they've been trying to achieve their entire lives, that's an extra 200 minutes. Uh, oxygen lasts about four hours at this exertion level. Uh, so it would have required a lot of extra oxygen to get the science team up there. Uh, plus the winds can change. Uh, plus eventually it starts to get dark. Uh, and the lead Sherpa uh, for the summit team in coordination with several of us at base camp made the very intelligent decision to turn around uh, at 84, 30 meters and come back down again. Uh, we managed to put in the highest automatic weather station the highest ice core in the world, and we managed to, uh, to come back down safely without creating even more stress 
uh, in an already stressful situation on the top of Everest. Uh, so, why Everest 2019? We wanted to get, whoops, all right. Uh, we wanted to touch the jet stream, sample the uh, jet stream. We wanted to be able to uh, learn more about uh, the water that feeds 20% of the world's population, the hazards in form of uh, slope stabilities and melting lakes and uh, health, the potential pollution that can come out of, uh, out of these melting glaciers. We wanted to contribute to uh, climate prediction in the mountains, but also globally by understanding more about what happens at these high elevations. Our ultimate goal is to provide information, which we're in the process of doing right now, uh, for a, a scientific journal called One Earth uh, that will help uh, in the sustainability of the cultures and the people who live in this area. Uh, and they know a lot about where they live. They understand the climate is changing. We want to be able to make better predictions for them, something that is hard for them to do, hard, for, hard to be done in general. And there are tremendous geopolitical implications of all of the changes that go on as a consequence of, in this particular case, uh, water resources. So we also developed uh, a legacy framework uh, for many other expeditions in the future. Uh, by having uh, research conducted in these five different disciplines with all of the different colored dots, you can see where we managed to roam around Mount Everest. Uh, Mount Everest is right uh, in this area that I'm moving my cursor around in. We actually moved into uh, this adjacent valley, the Gokio Valley, the Imja Valley, uh, and sampled right down to about 3,200 meters with many of the things that we conducted. <clears throat> Turning to something even more uh, related to the University of Maine, the other world record we set was the, I think, probably the highest graduation, uh, college graduation ever attained, but certainly at least the highest college graduation uh, for the University of Maine. So on 11 May, which was the uh, the day that graduation occurred in 2019, uh, back at home in Orono, Laura Mattis uh, received her Bachelor of Science. She was the, uh, she had the highest grades of any undergraduate student in the Mount Everest area from the University of Maine. Uh, and Heather Clifford uh, received her, uh, her master's degree. Uh, they made their own gowns out of uh, garbage bags and they made their own hats and then they got uh, diplomas. Apologies to President Thurimundi for going ahead and awarding these degrees on her own, but we, we thought she would, in fact, she has already verified the fact that that was, uh, that was okay. So uh, thank you for listening. It was a, an amazing experience for all of us. It was fantastic to be able to have six out of the 35 scientists uh, come from the University of Maine. Uh, we could have never done this, obviously, without uh, the resources, the organization, and the, guide, and the guiding of National Geographic Society. I'm Rolex, and a, a, a special thanks to Trebevin University, our Nepalese uh, academic colleagues, and most importantly, to the Sherpa climbing support and the local porters, the people who live in these areas, the people that we hope we will be able to help by the research that we've done. Thank you very much. Well, this is wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul. Folks, if you have questions that you'd like to submit, uh, please just go to the chat button at the bottom of your screen and type those in and we'll get to as many as we can. We've got several that have come in. One is, how did you get involved in this particular uh, project. Obviously, your reputation precedes you, so you're on everybody's radar, but could you explain a little bit how you were asked by uh, the organizers to, to take the lead, uh, such a lead role in this and how you recruited others to participate? I was approached, uh, I've never worked with National Geographic before. Uh, I was approached in uh, March or April of 2018 uh, to provide some ex advice about the expedition. <clears throat> How reasonable would it be to put weather stations in, uh, drill ice cores, and then within the following weeks, uh, they asked me to be the leader of the science program. <clears throat> and then sometime after that, they asked me to be the overall expedition leader. Um, 
I was asked to be involved because I've spent a lot of time <clears throat> in the Himalayas. You can tell by the silver hair that I've been around for a while. Um, and I, I've, I've had a lot of expedition. I've had a lot of experience leading uh, not only small two-person expeditions, but also very large multidisciplinary, multinational uh, expeditions. I considered it a great honor to have been uh, asked, and it's been a, a great opportunity. Um, although there was no hesitation on my part that I was willing to do this, uh, I was even more excited about it because this was an opportunity to reach effectively 1 billion people. National Geographic Society has an immense reach. Uh, and we already have had a film, a one hour documentary that came out about uh, two months ago. Um, July, they had a dedicated issue uh, for Everest, which uh, focused partially on our expedition, but also previous National Geographic expeditions. Uh, and then there are all sorts of learning tools that uh, National Geographic uh, Society has organized and National Geographic partners uh, for school children, for the public. So if you go to uh, natgeo.com, you can slash Everest, you can see a lot of these. Uh, they're an amazing group of uh, people to work with, highly professional, and it was, uh, it was a great opportunity, impossible to pass up. Yeah, very good. <clears throat> Could you just explain in general uh, how ice cores are used to measure changes in the climate and how they are time capsules of atmospheric composition over time? Absolutely. A, a beautifully stated question, too. Uh, I didn't state it that way. Some, somebody else did. I'm just the reader. <laughs> so um, ice cores are, as indicated, uh, a capsule going back in time. Uh, and we, we collect them from all over the world, uh, in some cases with very lightweight drills, as we did on Everest because of the elevation. Uh, in some cases, we drill back 10,000 feet to collect records that uh, go back year by year, 110,000 years. They are remarkable um, chronicles of the past. I like to say they don't lie. Uh, they just sit there and whatever's in the snow gets uh, uh, gets captured. Uh, they allow us to understand past temperature, precipitation, atmospheric circulation patterns, sea ice extent, volcanic activity, meteorite impacts, biological productivity in the ocean and on the land, forest fires, and it just keeps going on and on. Uh, it allows us to interact with a variety of disciplines. Uh, most recently, uh, for the last few years, but uh, historians at, uh, at Harvard have worked closely with us to compare their, their written records. Um, it's a way to find out, for example, whether or not legislation works. Uh, uh, in the case of lead, uh, we've been able to trace human uh, source lead from smelting and open pit mining back 2,000 years. Um, we've been able to detect uh, the deep, a, a drop down to almost zero level of lead during the Black Death, which is in the 1340s and 1350s, uh, when half the population of Europe died, all of a sudden, all of the sources of lead disappeared. Um, and in fact, we will, in the coming years, be able to detect, detect uh, the decreases in pollutants and greenhouse gases as a consequence of COVID-19, uh, too. So, um, it, it's, we've developed new technologies uh, at the University of Maine uh, that allow us not only to look at, uh, at the year's uh, worth of uh, um, ice core, but also down to the storm level. Uh, we've increased by two orders of magnitude sampling uh, resolution. So nowadays, we can say how long the summer was. Uh, whether or not there were storms during the summer and a variety of other things which are helping us to understand much more about uh, the likelihood and the characteristics of cha big changes like abrupt fast changes in the future. Where are your ice cores stored? <clears throat> in a very cold place. <clears throat> They're stored at about minus uh, 20. Um, primarily in a large freezer uh, in Bangor because we have so many ice cores. The ones that we work on uh, are actually stored at the Institute. Uh, we're able to probably keep um, maybe 300 meters worth of ice core. We have uh, many hundreds, if not a couple of thousand meters of ice core. 
uh, stored in other places. Uh, the part of the freezer uh, is dedicated to a very clean area so that we can cut the ice cores without contaminating them. And the, the chemistry that we look, in, look at in these ice cores, uh, in some cases, the levels are so low that if you took your unwashed hand uh, with a little bit of sweat on it and touch the ice core, you would actually uh, uh, recreate a, a massive marine storm that had blown into, uh, into the record at that particular time. So we have to be very careful about contamination. We have backup freezers at the university, uh, sorry, backup uh, generators at the university uh, in case there's a breakdown. And without the hard work of facilities at the University of Maine, uh, who, may, uh, who make sure that the freezers keep operating and all of our labs are, are continuing to operate and the millions of dollars of equipment that's in them under uh, the proper uh, humidities and temperatures, so we would be in big trouble. So we owe a big thanks to facilities at the University of Maine. Very good. Uh, somebody asked if you found plastic in the ice core. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, we did. Uh, well, not in the ice core yet. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't looked at it, plastic in the ice core, but we certainly found a lot of plastic uh, at hell, high elevation. Uh, this, was, this is actually one of uh, National Geographic's uh, big interests, tra uh, tracking plastics. Uh, and the plastics come from a variety of sources. Uh, no doubt the Kumbu region will have a lot more plastic than a lot of other parts of the Himalayas because of all of the, of the trekkers and, and the climbers uh, in the area. Uh, we also looked for a bunch of exotic chemicals, the what are called PFASs. These are forever chemicals. And in fact, we found some of those too um, in even these very high elevations. And over the following months, uh, we'll be looking more carefully for uh, exotic chemicals and the ice cores and the snow samples uh, in order to understand. How, we already know that the polar regions um, have uh, plastics coming into them. Obviously, the oceans do. Uh, we know that the remotest polar regions receive some amount of pollutant lead uh, and other toxic substances. Uh, now we're going to find out whether or not the very highest elevations on the planets also have the same situation. Very good, thanks. Uh, uh, given the environmental focus of the expedition, I'm reading here, how did the individual scientists manage personal biological waste? Ah. Also a very good question. Um, you know, typically in mountain areas, uh, the, most of the waste ends up going into a crevasse. We're not capable of, of carrying everything in and everything out. And they're usually very small teams. So uh, while there is an impact, it's very small. Uh, at a place like base camp with a thousand people at base camp, uh, the Nepalese government uh, ha actually has an, uh, a a group there that uh, enforces uh, what happens with human waste. And uh, there are small tents that are set up, tiny tents. Imagine uh, a porta potty except made out of canvas uh, and then a, a little seat and a 55 gallon drum and everything goes in there. And then those 55 gallon drums are taken by helicopter uh, to lower elevations where they can be processed the way you would process human waste. The higher you get, the harder it is. Um, there is always uh, some sort of footprint uh, that comes as a consequence of uh, the kind of research that we do. <clears throat> and in the case of Everest, obviously um, a footprint left by the climbers. But more and more, this is becoming a, uh, a recognized problem. Uh, and uh, much of the garbage that has been left over the years uh, all along in the Kumbu area is now gradually being uh, cleared up and it's actually being flown out by, by helicopter. And uh, close to Namche Bazaar, uh, there is a new facility that's going in. It's not a very large facility, but it's a processing facility. And there's a, an NGO, non-governmental organization, uh, that's trying to get uh, trekkers and climbers as they leave the Kumbu, uh, the high elevations of the Kumbu area to be carrying one or two kilos of garbage on their way out that goes to this processing center. So it's an understood problem. It hasn't been solved, uh, but it's something that uh, everybody recognizes is important that's being worked on. Thanks. 
We had a question about the, uh, how do you handle the maintenance and battery replacement of the, for the remote weather stations? Another excellent question. Um, there are solar panels. Uh, and of course, the hope is that the solar panels won't get covered with snow, um, that the automatic weather station won't be knocked down. Uh, but the powering is basically, the power comes to the, uh, to the batteries from the solar panels. Uh, thus far, uh, the automatic weather stations at high elevation have been up there uh, a little bit more than a year. Uh, and although there are small bits that are not working correctly, uh, which will ideally be corrected within the next year when it's possible to get up there, uh, almost everything is working uh, and the power is still continuing. I think there was a brief period when the solar one of the highest solar panels was covered with snow. So a little bit of the record was lost. Uh, but uh, there's still plenty of record there. Great. Uh, another question, and I hope I present this properly. It says, why do PB and CU levels go back up in the last decade or so after dropping due to legislation? Maybe you Not can some, explain what that... <clears throat> very good question. <clears throat> Somebody was paying attention there. Um, I was showing... Um, the examples from the north side of Mount Everest, an ice core that we collected there. Uh, and uh, the north side of Mount Everest, uh, while there was lead legislation uh, to the east in China, uh, the legislation for leaded uh, gasolines was uh, sort of intermittent uh, that was coming into that area. If I were to show pictures coming from, or data coming from Greenland, uh, and from European Alps, where we have been working, you do see a much clearer message. You see the levels of lead rising. Uh, they track very nicely the, the sort of our understanding of, of, the pro, of the amount of lead that was being utilized. And then you really see very dramatic drops. You see the same thing in particular for, uh, for sulfur compounds in the atmosphere. Uh, but that's exactly why ice cores don't lie. Um, the, and you can look directly at the data. And in this case, a very keen observer uh, noticed that uh, there, was, there was a rise. So if there is a rise, then you've got to be able to explain it. In this particular case, that rise was a, was a consequence of, as I said, um, a region which is not legislated in terms of its lead emissions. Uh, it would also be a great way to assess whether or not there was something new happening, new lead smelting. Classic example, yeah, our work on the Antarctic Peninsula, in particular done by uh, Mario Pototsky, uh, demonstrated a almost 100 times increase in the amount of uranium uh, coming into the Antarctic Peninsula in the last 35 years. Uh, that's from open pit mining. And you could clearly see when the, when the mine was most active, the levels rose. When the mine uh, became a little bit less active, you could see it dropping down. There is no legislation to prevent uranium in the atmosphere. And even more startling is the fact that the source of that uranium comes from Australia, which is on the other side of the southern hemisphere from Antarctica. So uh, these ice cores, in some cases, are monitoring things that come from uh, very distant and many potentially different areas. So you can sometimes get increases uh, that if you look at carefully are very important to explain. And it's a great way to monitor uh, success of legislation and, and who in fact is cheating and who's not. Interesting. Um, there's a question asking about uh, how viruses are transported in the atmosphere. And have you discovered or are you, is any of the work that you and others are doing looking at, at that? as part of your study of the atmosphere and, and uh, possibly through other forms of climate change? Research. It's certainly outside of my area of expertise. Um, they clearly with, uh, you know, these, these micro scale um, biological measurements that can be made nowadays, uh, there is the, the potential for doing this. Um, and as I mentioned with the eDNA, it's possible with, with one little portion of a fish scale to tell what type of fish or organism was, was in the lake. Um, as I said, I don't know the answer to viruses. I don't know how long uh, they can stay uh, live. Uh, 
uh, and whether or not they would remain alive in ice for a very long period of time. We can certainly see the, um, in the case of, for example, the Black Death and, and also our current case, we can easily see the change in emission levels because, of course, industrial activity decreases and transportation increases. But I think that the, looking for um, evidence of viruses is something that certainly people in the ice core field will look at, uh, and, and we will look at it. And there's an interesting that paper, paper that just came out by Italian colleagues, which is very encouraging for this. And they were actually able to determine different fragrances that come from the perfume industry in Europe in, in an ice core <clears throat> that they recovered from, uh, from the Italian Alps. And not only uh, and not only a fragrance, but several different types of fragrances. So the potential for viruses and it is certainly there. Great question. Interesting. We have a couple of questions about water. You had mentioned uh, 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 the, the water samples and somebody said, is it, is it liquid water we're talking about at that level? It, Another good question. Yes, uh, it, it, throughout, we were collecting water samples, snow samples, and ice samples. And uh, once you get uh, probably above 6,000 meters, the likelihood of seeing any water is very, very low. Uh, you might see water uh, where snow is melting in direct contact with dark rocks and where the sun can have an impact. Um, but but no, all of the water was collected at, uh, at elevations pretty much from base camp below. And the uh, snow and ice samples obviously come from higher up. Were you, were you able to test the purity of the water that villagers consume? Absolutely. That's one of our big goals. Uh, and what we found is that what the villagers are consuming is generally clean water. Uh, there are one or two trace metals, which are... Um, uh, slightly above safety standards. Uh, and it's an interesting situation here. When you go to most mountain glaciers in the world, uh, you, do, you can see very high pollutant levels coming out in the springtime. Because there has been so much melt of the glaciers in the Himalayas, um, much of the recent record in many places, the last 200 years, which is in particular when a lot of the pollutants coming in, an awful lot of that pollution has already melted away from the glaciers. So it is highly likely that the local people were exposed to higher levels of pollution in the last few years than they might be seeing now, because in effect, the glaciers are getting a little bit cleaner. If you go to the Arctic, this is a very serious problem because the melting glaciers in the Arctic, which have tons of pollutants in them, are introducing toxic metals and a variety of other things into the marine environment. And the marine mammals, which uh, the local Inuit people eat, are highly concentrated uh, with toxic substances. So the levels of cancers uh, amongst Inuit people in the Arctic are increasing dramatically as a consequence of warming and glacier melt. Mm. Uh, what about the, uh, I had a question about what's happening in the Kumbu region uh, during, the pan during the pandemic. What did you, what do you know about that? Well, we've been, uh, we keep in touch <clears throat> with our colleagues in the Kumbu area on, um, on a weekly basis, <clears throat> mostly because we're trying to mount another expedition to go up and make some minor repairs uh, to the automatic weather station, but also because many of us, you know, we have very, uh, you know, warm feelings about the people and, and we're trying to, uh, and, and we also work with, with many of them. Uh, all of the climbing and the tourism has pretty much been shut down. Uh, Kathmandu recently, in the last couple of weeks, if I understood correctly, uh, has gone, um, has finally opened up. Uh, people were self-isolating for many, many weeks. Kathmandu is a very crowded area. It's very hard to protect people. So the safest thing to do was just have people stay at home. In general, because of this self-isolation in the more urban, more dangerous areas for COVID-19, um, it is my understanding that COVID-19 has not spread into the mountain uh, towns. Uh, and as long as uh, tourism is uh, carefully 
uh, monitor, there's a very good chance that they'll be okay. Um, having been one of the people who uh, ended up uh, catching a virus on the 2019 expedition, this is not a good place to get a virus. Uh, you already have enough trouble breathing uh, at these elevations. Um, as I said, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to come back down for a couple of days. I ended up on an IV because uh, it was H1N1. I took uh, Tamiflu and two or three days later, I was able to walk right back up the mountain again. Uh, so uh, this is a very bad place to get sick, um, not, not just for tourists, but even the local people who are so well adjusted to it. Mm, interesting. Uh we had a question asking if you were, uh, could comment on the Nature Communications Earth and Environment article that stated that the Greenland ice sheet had passed the point of no return and will completely melt. Is that, uh, is that research widely supported by the research community? It's a pretty bold statement. Um, you know, the, the Greenland ice sheet is the second largest uh, ice sheet in the world uh, after the Antarctic. Uh, it, uh, I've spent a lot of time in the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, it is remarkable that in the last few years, the entire surface has melted uh, a little bit. Um, there are certainly uh, along the edges, coastal glaciers that are uh, accelerating. Uh, there's one glacier in particular on the west coast that drains uh, fairly significant portion of the ice sheet. And as it speeds up, it could drain more and more. Um, but the complete disappearance of the Greenland ice sheet is highly unlikely. <clears throat> we know that even under naturally warm conditions, it got a lot smaller, but it didn't disappear completely. <clears throat> there is, uh, to say that this is a turning point, uh, you know, in a way, uh, that's correct, because we have no reason to assume that the temperatures will cool. Uh, in the next uh, few decades or even a couple of hundred years. Uh, to say that this is the absolute turning point and from here on uh, the Greenland ice sheet will disappear is a bit more dramatic. Um, if the temperatures can increase, continue to increase the way they are expected to, it is possible in two to 500 years that the Greenland ice sheet could dramatically uh, decrease. Uh, by my saying that this is not as dramatic as what the uh, what that article said is in no way should be as, uh, assumed as uh, as a uh, as my saying that this is not a very serious situation, um, and I think it's important uh, to hear all of the sides. I think that's probably a more dramatic view uh, than I would take, uh, but nevertheless, it's not impossible. And it comes under the category of what I call plausible scenarios, which is something that our institute has actually pioneered. Uh, whenever you are looking at the future, whether it's something that's personal or something that's big like the climate, you always want to know what the extremes are. And, and that is a plausible extreme. Thanks. We've got time for one more question. We've had some great ones come in and I wish we could get to all of them, but uh, this, uh, Post said, I imagine there are many discouraging things about studying climate change and glaciers in these times. As a result of this most recent expedition, was there something that you feel particularly positive about or made you feel hopeful? That's a great question. I, I've been involved in the field for a long time and I, I do spend a lot of time speaking about it. Uh, and I, I think we need to be realistic uh, about the impacts on our health, uh, on our economy, uh, and, you know, the numbers of potential climate refugees. This is all, this is all very serious stuff. Uh, having said that, uh, I am very hopeful uh, because I think uh, at a certain point, uh, we will all become aware enough of what's going on to realize that this is important, that we need to deal with it, and that in fact, it's a win-win situation. It is our opportunity uh, to really force ourselves into renewable energy, which will change our, our geopolitical status, which will change uh, levels of pollution. It'll create, it's already creating tremendous new jobs. <clears throat> so I'm hopeful that we will realize what's going on. I am hopeful that this will 
have a silver lining in some way uh, in terms of uh, new ways of, uh, of functioning, uh, the possibility that in fact we will be healthier people in the future because we will be emitting fewer uh, pollutants. You know, one of the reasons why uh, some people are susceptible, many, many people are susceptible to COVID-19 is not just because they're exposed to it, it's because they're not as healthy as, as they would be if we had a clear environment. They suffer uh, respiratory diseases, some of which are related to, uh, to pollution, um, cardiac disease, cancers, neurological <clears throat> diseases. So I'm hopeful that we will make our way towards an even better quality of life than we have now. I'm also hopeful that we realize uh, and are sympathetic to the fact that uh, living in Maine, uh, are, we in many ways are protected. This is a wonderful place in terms of natural resources uh, and population density, and, and it, it, it'll change to some degree, but there'll be parts of the world uh, that really don't have much of a chance. Desert regions, uh, small islands, areas where food security becomes more critical. And I hope that this will be an opportunity for us to become more sympathetic and, uh, and return to, in fact, the way we have been for many decades and uh, opening, opening up our, our, uh, our abilities uh, to help the rest of the world. Right. Well, uh, Dr. Paul Majewski, thank you for everything you do for, sh for the preparation for today, for the research that you're doing and for uh, making us all proud of UMaine through the reputation you've helped build for UMaine through your international work. Thank you so much. Folks, we'll be following up with you with a, a, a survey asking you for your feedback on this session. You'll be getting that uh, within the next day or so. And we're also looking for ideas for future webinars. We hope you uh, enjoyed this. Again, we are grateful for everything that uh, our faculty at the University of Maine do. And uh, uh, please let us know uh, what feedback you have. Please stay well, stay healthy, and uh, thank you again for joining us. Take care. <laughs>